Good afternoon and welcome to Merrillville High School. Uh, just kind of like a classroom in here today. I see everyone's in the back of the room, including principals, so just joking. Uh, Michelle would lecture all of us on that. So uh, I want to welcome everyone here today uh, for a celebration of life for Mrs. Michelle Sulich. What a great person, what a great friend. Uh, I'd like to personally like to welcome Michelle's mother, Mona Simmons, uh, her sister, Ginger Shannon, her brother, Sean Simmons, and her nephew that she raved about all the time, uh, Rick. Uh, I know that this has been a tough few months for the family, but you've all come together along with the Pirate family uh, as we got through uh, these final days with Michelle in many different regards. So, I, and then I welcome the rest of the family that's here. Uh, as I look around this gym today, it was perfect Mich uh, Michelle Sulich. We had folks talking, reminiscing, going over things. We haven't seen each other for years, but caught right on. See, that's what Michelle was all about. She was about making everyone's life that much better. She did it every single day that she walked in this building. She was someone that I looked up to uh, very much so. We started 30 years ago. Well, I've got three years on her. But we both started as teachers. Uh, and she taught right next to me. And uh, if you know anything about me, my loud mouth always gets me in trouble. But at lunch, she'd say, hey, quiet down. You're scaring my students. And I said, OK, Michelle, I'll do my very best. I don't know if I ever got any better. But she was always pointing things out to me. She moved on, and she got her guidance degree. And I got my uh, secondary, my master's in secondary education. Next thing you know, I moved into an assistant principal role. She moved into the guidance office and uh, started running our guidance department. Got her assistant uh, principalship and became our guidance director. I became the principal. She was very detailed all the time, crossing her T's and dotting her I's. And I was very, uh, well, not like that at all. She would remind me of that all the time. A few weeks ago, we went over to Michelle's house. Ginger had said that Michelle needed a ramp built. And uh, Jimmy Stamper, one of our assistant principals, stepped right up to the plate, said, uh, meet me over at Lowe's after summer school. And we got a makeshift crew together, and we headed over to Portage. Uh, and it wasn't so much that Michelle wanted the ramp for herself, but she was so selfless. She never, ever, ever, it was about everyone else. She didn't want to put anyone out. So we started building the ramp. And I need to tell this story because it's pretty funny. Uh, Greg Geimer was there, one of the, uh, her counselors. Uh, Jimmy, assistant principal. Uh, Mike Knocky showed up. Greg Geimer, who she really loved, he was doing double duty. He was trimming up some bushes and putting some nails in that ramp. Uh, Mr. Seligman was there. And Michelle stationed herself just so she could, she could see what was going on there. Uh, in the front room. She was in a recliner, and every once in a while I'd catch her eye looking out, making sure that we were doing the right thing. So after we had, uh, we worked till dark, got that front ramp done and, done, and if it wasn't for Jimmy, it would have never got done. Uh, so we walked in, and Michelle uh, said, and uh, students don't listen, but she said, let's have a beer. And so the five of us, now she didn't have one, but she made sure that we celebrated a little bit and she said, Jimmy, thank you so much for all that you've done. And she went down the line. Well, she saved me to last like she usually did, would. And she said, uh, uh, Greg, great job on the bushes. And Chaz Seligman, well, thanks for coming. Mike Knocky, thanks for coming. And Mike, just like usual, you were standing around supervising. <laughs> and she got me. But you know, the thing about Michelle, and I want everyone in this building to think about it today, 
She always told you what you needed to hear, whether you wanted to or not. She always pointed you in the right direction because that's what she was all about. She's a counselor, she's a friend, she's a confidant, she was a sister, an, uh, an aunt, and she, she just always, always, always would do the right thing for folks. And I'll never forget about that. Uh, see, if you look around today, Michelle would be smiling because her family is here, her former students are here, her colleagues are here, especially her counseling crew, who she took great pride in leading. All here is Sharon in a celebration for her. And mind you, folks have come from all over the country to be here. Facebook was blowing up. I don't know how to get on Facebook, but that's what they tell me. <laughs> As I shared the news with our staff of Michelle's passing a few short days ago, I mentioned that we lost a special person. First, a super teacher who always put students first. Second, a super colleague who always had an open ear for whatever you needed. And lastly, and uh, most importantly, we lost a friend who was so selfless and giving in all of her actions. And we should all take that and model it as we leave today. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to bring to the podium Father Kevin McCarthy to begin today's program. Father Kevin. I had the privilege of twofold. I'm the, I just became the pastor of Nativity of Our Savior in Portage. But 25 years ago, I prepared Mark and Michelle and performed their wedding service. About a week and a half ago, I anointed her and dressed her with the spiritual clothes for her to go and meet the Lord and the privilege. And so I bring to you the prayers of the community of Nativity of Our Savior. Um, and not just for this day and not just for tomorrow but next month and next year. And I share with you a scripture story and then I'll invite you for one challenge. Gospel according to Luke. Now, they're the first, now that the very first day of the week, two of the disciples were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus. And they were conversing about all the things that had occurred and how it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? And they stopped, looking downcast. And one of them named Cleopas said to him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened and taken place here these days? And he replied to him, what sort of things? They said to him, the things that happened to Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people. And our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But they would hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's now the third day since this took place. And some women from our group are ever have astounded us that they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. And came back and reported they had seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. And some of those went with us to the tomb and found things just as the woman had described. But him they did not see. And then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe that all the prophets spoke. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter in his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the scriptures that referred to him. And as they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on further. But they urged him, stay with us. It's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. And it happened that I was, while he was with them at table, he took the bread, he said the blessing and broke it and gave it to them. 
And with that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us as he spoke to us on the way, and how he opened scriptures to us? So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven, and those who were with him, saying, The Lord has truly been raised. He's appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had happened on the way, and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. My friends, each one of you walk into this gym this day very much similar to those two disciples on that road to Emmaus. There's a midst of sadness and a midst of sorrow. There's a midst of question and doubt. There's a midst of fear and anxiety. We we wonder why and how could this happen? Our hearts are broken. We find ourselves downcast. And it is the Lord who comes to meet us in each other. It is the Lord who comes to listen to our pain and our suffering, our grief, our brokenness. And it is the Lord who comes to open our eyes and set our hearts on fire. In honor and memory of Michelle, I'd ask you to do two things in her memory. First of all, each one of you probably have that special memory, that special story how she was there for you in your moment of need. I'd ask you to hold on throughout this service, to hold on to that memory, to that story, maybe more than one. But as long as there are memories and as long as there are stories to share and tell, the spirit of that person is alive. And secondly, whether it be here in this place at the end, whether it be at the the VFW or the meal and all of that, I want you to share that story with someone else of who this woman was to you and for you. And thereby her spirit continues to remain alive. And then I need you to do just as the disciples did. and, And they ran back to the others to say that he was alive. He had risen. He had risen indeed. And so it is with us as people of faith. We believe that she is alive. And she has gone to be with the Lord who has been preparing this place, this mansion in heaven. We must be there to comfort and console one another. Thank you, Father Kevin. As we go through today, we will remember the stories and share them, and it will bring us great, uh, it'll get us through some tough times. At this time, I would like to bring up Dr. Tony Lux, uh, who will be uh, our next speaker. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope to say a few words today and the spirit in which I think Michelle would like to uh, hear them said. As you know, she is a joyous person and she wants a celebration to be joyous. And I think she wants some good stories to be told and some things to be shared that might bring a little laughter to us in her memory because that's the way she lived her life. Uh, We're only here for a short time, but it doesn't mean it can't be a good time. And I think that that's the way she wanted to live her life and did live her life. Those of you who know the Maryville Schools know that we've got a lot of confident, courageous, capable, strong-willed people in our school system. And a lot of those are women. And Michelle is one of those, always was one of those. And Michelle, when she would get worked up about something, she would wear her heart on her sleeve. 
And she would get worked up and say, we've got to do some things for these kids and we've got to make these things change and we've got to put things, programs into place. And when I would see her get worked up like that, my superintendent's spider sense would say, have her talk to Mike Crutz first. <laughs> Let her take it out on him, which she always did, and then I'd step in and agree to whatever she wanted to do. <laughs> if there was sainthood for educators, I think Michelle would be at the top of the list. And I looked up the requirements to become a saint. What does it take for someone to become a saint? Well, there's a few. Basically, a life of service and great faith. Evidence of heroic virtue. She exemplified heroically those virtues necessary for sainthood. Faith. Faith in her students, faith in every student that walked through the halls of this school, believing that they could, every one could be successful, every one would graduate and meet the requirements that they needed. Hope. She hoped the best for every student, hoped for their success and that every student would graduate with a plan for what their future would be. Charity or generosity. There wasn't anything she wouldn't do for any student. Lunch money, fee money, food after school, paying for tickets to go to games or concerts. Anything she could do to help them, she would do. Out of her own pocket or find other people to contribute and help out as well. Prudence, thoughtful, well-reasoned decision-making. She knew what kids needed, and she made sure that those things happened. Justice, equal opportunity for all. Her definition of equality was not doing the same thing for everybody but helping in proportion to the need. The greater the need, the greater the help. That's what equality meant for her. Fortitude. Never, ever giving up on anyone. No matter what they did, no matter what struggles, no matter how many chances they needed, she would find a way to stick it out with them and, and find a way to help them find success. But fulfilling those virtues came with a lot of personal sacrifice. And she gave that personal sacrifice with her time, with her emotions. She felt personally responsible for everything that happened in this high school. There are a lot of things about Maryville High School, the trimester schedule in particular, that everybody, I think, takes for granted in terms of what it did to help students reach success. But that trimester schedule, its purpose was to give students as many opportunities as they needed, whether it be advanced placement classes or dual credit, or if they stumbled and failed a class, to repeat that class as quickly as possible to get back on the right track. But that didn't just happen. Those schedules had to be changed every trimester. Every six to eight weeks, she'd have to change the schedules for hundreds of kids, and she'd have to spend that time to make sure it happened. Every time there was a change in graduation requirements, she had to make sure that everybody knew what those graduation requirements were and how to make those changes and make it work for our kids. And that the kids knew what their graduation requirements were. Testing. 
I-STEP testing, ECAs, advanced placement, dual credit, college transcripts, college applications, scholarship applications, meetings with parents so they understood what was needed for their kids, for those scholarships, for those college applications, for those career choices after high school. That created tremendous stress. And she lived with that stress year round. She wore it on her sleeve, but at the same time, people did not see it. The kids she dealt with did not see it. They saw the joy. They saw what she was willing to do. Turn her office into a locker room. How many times did I go in there and see kids uh, book bags and gym stuff and stuff they needed for practice that night in her office, but that's what she did to make things work for the kids. Another requirement is the performance of miracles. To be a saint, you must perform two bona fide miracles that would have no other explanation except for the intervention of that person. Two miracles were never a problem because she performed hundreds of miracles and many of those miracles are here today in this gym. There is one stumbling point that we have to figure out. To be a saint, there can be no evidence of worshiping false gods or being part of a cult. That's literally in there. <laughs> Luckily, she's a Cub fan, so we don't have to worry about that part with her socks. But, as you know, she was completely loyal to Jimmy Buffett and the Parrot Heads. <laughs> so for that aspect, I just want you to know I do have a confession to make and something that I'm going to carry with me in her memory, and that is... <laughs> you know, if Michelle could, she would have lived the life of a Jimmy Buffett song. And Jimmy Buffett once said, if there's a heaven for me, I'm sure there's a beach attached. And I think that's what Michelle would hope for too. And I think Michelle is a saint in that heaven of hers. And my wish for you, Michelle, is that in your heaven, in your beach in heaven, that you are knee deep in water, somewhere got the blue sky breeze, blowing wind through your hair, where the only worry is whether the tide is gonna reach your chair. We wish only the greatest in memories for Michelle and all that she's done for our students, our school system, and our community, and her family. Thank you. Well, I have a confession to make. I was uh, really nervous today, and I forgot to have our opening song. So at this time, I am going to ask Taylor Carter, Taylor, to come up, and we're going to hear some beautiful music. Michelle loved this kind of stuff. Ooh, Jesus. She did indeed love this kind of stuff.
that you dare to dream really do come true. Someday I wish upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me. Where troubles turn to limit traps away above the chimney tops. That's where Thank you, Taylor. At this time, from the guidance department, I would like to bring up Sarah Daniels, guidance counselor. How does one, oh, sorry. How does one even begin to describe Michelle Sulich? Michelle was so many, much to so many. Individuals knew her as Mrs. Sulich, Sulich, Suli, Mama Sulich, Michelle, Aunt Shelley. We all remember her as our aunt, sister, daughter, mentor, teacher, counselor, colleague. But mostly she was a friend in the best sense of the world. I just want to share my very first interaction with Michelle because I feel like it's something that many of you could probably relate to as well. Um, I was a first year teacher and I had rushed out of here on a Friday afternoon and back then we used to get our paper paychecks and I had forgotten to grab mine on the way out the door and I had gotten home and remembered and rushed back up to the school hoping to catch someone. Of course, offices were closed, but there was one person still here working, and that was Michelle. And she stopped me to see if there was anything I needed, and I told her about the situation. I didn't want to inconvenience her, but she insisted that I was not leaving here without my paycheck. So she was opening every office, drawers, calling people. I felt so bad because I knew she was probably wanting to get out of here as well, but she never made me feel like an inconvenience. And I think that is just who Michelle was. She would help anybody, um, current students, a student that graduated 15 years ago, staff members, parents, she was always willing to do whatever you needed, and she never complained. She never made you feel bad about it. She just did it, and that's just because who she was. As a counselor, Mrs. Sulich continued to work with students and guided them down successful paths. Many former students will admit they had a coming to Jesus talk with Mrs. Sulich at one time or another. She was real with everyone she spoke with. She did not hold back to inform a student if she believed they were making poor choices. And then not only would she encourage them, but she would support them any way she could. And I think that's something that really stands out to me is she never just told a student, oh yeah, you could do this. She made sure that if she encouraged you, she was going to be there with you every step of the way. And she even did that with me when I made the decision to become a guidance counselor. I was worried about taking on extra courses while working full time and doing an internship. And she pretty much told me that 
if I decided to make that decision, she would make sure that I was successful. And I know I wouldn't be where I am today without her. And I think a lot of people in this room could say the same thing. She moved into the assistant principal of counseling services only a few years after being a school counselor. And we all know Michelle was one of the busiest people any of us had ever known. She took her role very seriously. And in our department, we would always joke that you know, she was the captain of our ship. And if the ship went down, we were all going down together. And she was a true leader. And we would follow her wherever she led us. I remember the day that she was diagnosed and she and Rick came in to tell our department. And even then, getting the worst news of her life, her first concern was about our department and what was gonna happen without her and us having too much work thrown at us. And the next five months, every time I spoke to her, she would make me promise that I was not stressing myself out and that I was not to worry about her. That's just who she was. She, to the very end, put others ahead of herself. There isn't one person in this gymnasium that hasn't been touched by her kindness in one way or another. She was there to lend a few dollars to anyone in need, give advice on which pathway to go, and even more importantly, lend an ear or shoulder to cry on. Michelle Stulich gave so much of herself to those around her. Today, we remember what an amazing individual she was. She will live in our hearts for many years to come. Remember the kind words she shared, remember the laughs she shared, and remember the time that we all shared with her. And remember to be amazing and follow in her footsteps. Michelle touched many, many students throughout her career, and we do have some students here that we are gonna uh, bring up next. And uh, the McCarthy boys, I'm gonna go with age first, so Timideo, I'm ready for you to come up. Timideo is a Ball State graduate, and uh, one of Michelle's favorites, Timideo. It takes a village to raise a child. Michelle Sulich was a vital part of that village called Merrillville High School. Mrs. Sulich was like a high school student whisperer. She embodied the compassion, the patience necessary to motivate students to focus on their goals. What we appreciated about her the most, she wanted to see all of us be successful regardless of our backgrounds or our differences. Sulich was more than a high school guidance counselor to me and my brothers. She was a friend, a confidant, a problem solver, a peacemaker, and a voice of reason. Sulich has been a part of every significant event in our family's lives, from the passing of our father to the birth of our children. As you can tell by the number of people here, <clears throat> she just wasn't here for the McCarthy's, but she was here for the entire community. I'm proud to have called her my friend, and my wife, because I couldn't get into the hospital to see her after hours, so I had to use that excuse. <clears throat> I'm proud to say that she was the perfect example of unconditional love. As much as it pained me to not have her physical presence, I'm proud that she leaves her legacy behind in each and every one of us. We love you, Michelle Sulich, until we meet again. <clears throat> Love you, 
you know, um, you know, a lot of times people talk about talk about being a game changer and a and a, and a world changer and um, you know making a difference and uh, Sully did that. She did it. And you know, self, selflessly, selfishly, um, you know, that's why we hate to see her go. But um, you know, we all have so much to learn from the legacy that she left behind, the the selflessness, the um, I mean, she would do anything for anyone, and she's done anything for all of us, and uh, just her heart, you know, how she gives gives unconditionally. She loves and she loves unconditionally. And, um, you know, she was there for us, our family. My mom, who's in the uh, stands, she was there for her when we lost our father, you know, in 2012. And um, she's been there for us through and through. I, I wouldn't have made it to college if not for her. Wow. You know, her and, her and um, Coach Wells were in my living room. <laughs> with my mother and father and, and um, you know, just they loved so much and they cared so much and they, and, they, and they made sure that, you know, I was gonna make it. And she didn't have to do that. She didn't have to do that. She didn't have to, 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 to lay her life down for every single one of us in here, but she did. So on behalf of us and every one of you guys out there, we love you. We, we were going to miss you, and uh, we're thankful to God that we had you. Another Maryville High School um, alumni, and I'm sure you're going to hear the family theme. The Neal family is a big family in the Pirate family, but it's my honor and pleasure to uh, bring to the podium Michael Neal. Okay, it's like, where do you start? Um, I'm trying to think about this in the chronological order so I can tell it to you the way that I received it. Um, June 30th, I was here in Maryville and I was here for all of a day. And I told myself, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go see Shelly. She's probably happy that I'm calling her Shelly because I couldn't call her Shelly for her. God only knows how long, but um, I didn't go see her. Um, I figured, you know, I'll be back in August. My cousin's getting married. I'll be able to have the opportunity to see her then. And, um, you know, I get a text from my mom. Sorry for pausing for so long because I'm trying to cry. I got a text from my mom and she, you know, she said, she just passed the news over to me. It took me like 45 minutes, and I'm like, there ain't no way. Like, I just, I knew it just wasn't possible because I know who Shelly is, and I don't know if you all know what warriors are, but that's a warrior. That lady lived the life of a warrior. People see the sickness, but you got to rewind it back about eight years, and things in her life started to go disarray, and not only was she here to help so many people, I don't think that people took the time out to realize the things that she was going through personally. And I hear the theme selfless. She didn't care about that stuff that happened to her because her main concern was the people that's sitting in this gym, the families that she can help, the kids that she can put to college, how she can change not only this community, I got word that she was asked to come and try to implement the same systems in the Gary school systems, she changed a lot of people and did a lot of things. And she was very selfless. And the only thing I can think to myself was how selfish, how 
how selfish was I to assume that she would be here in August and that I would have the opportunity to see her. And instantly I just start crying. So my daughter walks up to me. She's like, Daddy, why are you crying? And I'm like, Daddy's friend, she, uh, you know, she had to go. So she looked at me and she goes, well, where did she go? And I couldn't help but to laugh because kids are inquisitive. They want to know everything. I said, well, she went bye-bye, Shelly. My daughter's name is Shelly. I want to name my daughter after somebody that I looked up to and that inspired me. And I wanted to keep the theme, the M. I'm Michael. I want to name my kids after me. And, you know, I called Shelly and I told her, I said, Shelly, you're going to be happy about this. Not only am I going to name my daughter Michelle, <laughs> I'm going to nickname her Shelly because I can never call you Shelly, so I might as well call somebody else Shelly. <laughs> she laughed and um, she was very appreciative of that. And um, I'm appreciative to see the McCarthy's. I know Daisy can relate to this story. Ms. Sue used to come pick me up in high school and give me opportunities to make money because I didn't have a job at the time. And the one thing that she always told me was like, Michael, you're different. Stop trying to fit in. You know, you're not gonna live the same life everybody else is. You're just different. She had a spirit of discernment. She was able to look at people and look right through you. I heard somebody say that she was able to look at you and tell what you needed. That's exactly what she could do. Not only could she tell you what you needed, she was able to fix the problem and she would have a solution before you can even blink your eyes. And that's what she was to me. And she, she came and picked us up and I remember one time we waxed a car. <laughs> it was me, Daisy, and J, JB outside waxing that car. I swear to you, it took us about three hours. Came outside, I, Ms. Sulis, we done. She come outside, well, I still see wax. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm like, there ain't no way. Days, you know what I'm talking about. I'm like, are you kidding me? So we still got to clean all the wax off this car? But the thing was, as we walked out, she, I can't even remember how much money she gave us, but at the time, it was a lot more than I would have asked her for. And, um, you know, but that just goes to show you who she is. And I remember when I got the phone, when I got a phone call from uh, one of my high school colleagues and, you know, they told me that they had an opportunity to talk to her and when she got diagnosed and, you know, I hadn't called her and I knew that she was, it was about two weeks in and I couldn't do it. I wasn't brave enough to do it because I'm like, I don't want to address this. And I'm like, she's going to cry the whole time. I don't want to cry. I called her and she picked up the phone and she just cried and cried and cried. And the only thing she told me was she said, Mikey, I'm scared. And I told her, I said, Shelly, Scared of what? Like, look at all the things that you've come, that you've surmounted in your life. You went from the lowest of lows and lived the highest of highs. And she just said, I'm scared. And I'm like, Shelly, I'm not worried about it. I'm like, listen, we'll do whatever we can, find the best doctor. She said, it's not about the money. I said, it never was because we wouldn't be on this phone if it was about the money. And, you know, from that point on, I just, I would never believe that it would have come to what it came to. But, what I want to try to impart in everybody in this gym is this. You have to know the power of influence. Every individual person carries influence. Every individual person carries a light. Sulish lit that light up in me and told me, listen, if you didn't straighten up, you wouldn't be where you were. But that's the power of influence. And then you take your influence and you know how you can influence other people. And you plant that light in them. Because if she didn't plant that influence in me, I wouldn't have the ability to implant that influence not only in my, in my one brother here, my other brothers, the people that come in contact with my life, anybody that I've ever touched, I've ever looked at, that looked at me as a success. I go right back to the stories back from when I was in this gym. Coach Yeldon, I know you were here somewhere, and Coach Atria. I remember the time <laughs> I was short. This is my senior year, and I got a scholarship to Purdue. I didn't have the grades. Coach Yeldon pulled me into his office. Coach Atria, he was my AP bio teacher at the time. Soon as I talked to Yeldon, Yeldon talked to Atria, they worked out a plan. Might have been a little cheating in there a little bit, you know. But they had to get me to college, so. <laughs> but they created the opportunity for me to be able to make up some of the assignments that I missed or redo a test or whatever the case may be so I can get to college. But as you can see, she didn't just live with that. Coach Yelton lived with that. Coach Atria lived with that. 
everybody in this gym that she came in contact with, they carry that same light. And I just want you all to know this, you don't have to say goodbye. I don't say goodbye. I'm happy in a sense that I didn't go see her in the condition that she was in because this is how I saw Shelly. This is my last image of her. And I would much rather have that image in my life to, to live with than to watch her suffer. So you have to understand that and take that with you and understand who you are and who you influence and leave a legacy because if it wasn't for a legacy, we all wouldn't be sitting in this gym. Don't say goodbye, we'll see you later. Because guess what? We all are a power of light. That's where we come from. We're gonna go back to light and that's exactly where Ms. Sulich is gonna be at. And I appreciate you for taking your time out to listen to what I have to say. And I'm gonna let my brother say a couple words and uh, Shelly, you know I love you. And, uh, I'm glad that you changed that damn Jimmy Buffett uh, voicemail. <laughs> um, one of the things I remember is that I saw my Sulish two times before I went to Philadelphia. The first day I heard the news, she got diagnosed. I heard it from my brother. I was training down in Tampa at the time I was living with him. And I couldn't believe it, just like everybody else. Um, it was a blow that I still feel at this very moment, man. My heart is just is aching. But uh, when he told me the news, man, I sent her a text. I couldn't help it. I didn't want to because, I mean, I knew everybody was going to flood it with it. But I was like, I can't help it. That's my mama. I mean, we call her our second mama in our family. That's really, that's my second mama right there. But uh, I texted her, and not even two minutes later, she called me saying the same thing. You know, I'm scared. And, I never had anything happen. Like, why is everything gotta happen to me? And I'm just like, you know what? You are the strongest person I ever met in my entire life to take blow after blow after blow and continue to give 110% to every single person every day, but don't give a lick to yourself and you just keep going. She came to my senior game because my grandma passed a while back and she was supposed to be there, but the one person that showed up was Miss Sulich. And she was there, I got the pictures and all, and just, that's the type of person she was, man. I still got voicemail from her from when I left high school. She called me just saying, you know, I miss you, I love you, I hope you're doing well. And every time I came back to Miracle, Indiana, the first place I would go is here to see her. And it was just, it's always a great thing seeing that face and that long, beautiful hair that I used to always say, girl, you got, you got Drake, man, you got that hair. I want my hair to be like yours. <laughs> <laughs> She was always say, you gonna catch up to me? I'm like, nah, I ain't gonna never catch up to you. You got it, girl, you got it. But, you know, she just had the heart of a lion, man. That woman is part of the reason why we are all here today. And to look around in this gym is just a blessing to see that everybody has a piece of themselves sewage to go around forever and ever. And that even though she may not be here in the present physically, her soul and spirit is in every single one of us in this gym today. And we can go around and tell everybody the great story of this woman. I remember, in high school, you know, she used to always push me, like, you're gonna be the first one in the family to gra graduate with academic honors. You're gonna do it, you're gonna do it. I'm like, Sue, I'm not taking Spanish three. I'm not taking none of that, I can't do that. <laughs> She's like, no, you can do it, I'm telling you, you can do it. I'm just like, nah, but <laughs> she pushed me to do that, and I remember I, I came back from a visit from Michigan State, and I thought I was gonna go there, I really did. I turned away every college that called me, those all small schools, and, you know, we go up there and I get turned down. I'm not getting scholarships to Michigan State. I come back and we're trying to regroup in her office and I just sit there bawling with my, bawling my eyes out because I'm, I'm not going to go to college. I done did everything. I try, I try to do everything. I played good, but nobody's looking at me. And she grabbed me and looked at me and said, you're going to go to college and you're going to play football. You're going to get that degree. And that day we made over 20 copies of a highlight film and the transcripts and the letters, emailing it to every head coach, assistant coach on every team staff. And out of nowhere, I'm sitting at home in my bathroom crying again. I get a call from Southern Illinois saying we want to give you a full ride scholarship to play football here. And I just will never forget. It was because of her, man, just keeping that spirit and just keep going. And she's just one of the greatest people I ever met. And I will never forget that smile, that love, that heartbeat. She was relatable. She didn't care where you was from. She didn't care if you didn't have no home, if you had a home. She didn't care if you was rich, if you was poor. She saw something in every single person she crossed. And I always pray to God at night that I live in the image of God and I represent him in the best way possible. She was that in every, and then some. She showed love, she showed passion, understanding, motivation, everything. And 
you know, just like my brother said, I would not be a Philadelphia Eagle today. I wouldn't be in the NFL today if it was not for that woman being in my life. And I just want to let you all know that, man, we, made, we met one, one great person, man. We may have lost on earth, but Angel gained a star player. And a lot of star players are individuals, but this star player was the best team player I've ever seen in my life. So, Ms. Sulich, I can't wait to see you again. I love you. You better have them Oreo balls for me when I get there. <laughs> and you better be playing that same E40 CD you played in Slug Bug that one day. <laughs> love you, Ms. Sulich. Thank you, Neil boys. Great job. I know how much Michelle meant to you guys and your family. Uh, at this time, I'd like to bring back Taylor Carter. She's gonna sing our, our closing song, and then we will end our program with uh, Michelle's nephew who will be coming up, Rick. So, Taylor. You guys are lucky you can speak. I have no words, so I just sing them. <laughs> I told them I didn't know if I was gonna make it through the second one. I see trees of green, red and roses too. I see them blue for me and Legitimately see her face when I listen to her all the time. She'd be like, Taylor, you're so hot. <laughs> and, uh, I remember being in, a, in LA and I was, I was on the floor singing a show and, and then I called her and told her that I got cut. And she still watched it anyway the whole season because she said it must have been a mistake. <laughs> she even, uh, took me to the audition for The Voice when I was 17, and, and she cried because they told me I couldn't audition until I was 18 yet. And she used to tell me all the time, what are you still doing here? And so then I moved to Chicago and now I'm moving to New York, and I wish that I could tell her that. So thank you guys. Um, I see trees of green, red roses too. I see the blue for me and you, and I think to myself. What a wonderful world I see skies of blue and clouds of white A dark blessed day, warm sacred night And I think to myself What a wonderful world Pretty in the sky, and also are the faces on the people passing by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, How do you do? They're always saying, I love you. I hear babies cry. I think to myself
And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm glad she recovered because I certainly couldn't have finished that song. <laughs> okay. At this time, our final tribute will come from Michelle's nephew, Rick. So, Rick, come on up here. Rick has been instrumental uh, in helping us since uh, Michelle was diagnosed. And uh, what a great guy we've... Uh, spoke a few times on different things, uh, but he's been the, the rock to help the family get through it. So, Rick. I kept telling myself to uh, be prepared to be overwhelmed. I'm glad I did that. <laughs> because this is nothing short of that. So, Good afternoon, everybody. Again, thanks for taking the time to be here with us. Uh, it's an important day, a memorable day, um, a sad day, but it's going to be a happy day, too, because Michelle does not want us to cry forever. She said it's okay to cry, but you're not going to cry forever. It's hard to put into words the sheer magnitude of people that lent a hand, uh, brought groceries, uh, the, the meals, the ramp, the, the outreach, the people wanted to see her win uh, because she deserved it. And uh, we were all hoping for a much happier ending. Um, it just wasn't meant to be. We, we threw the world at it. And as you said, she was a warrior. She did everything she could. We did everything we could. Those selfless acts were not unnoticed by the family, so I wanted to take this time to again thank everybody that, uh, that stepped in and helped, helped carry the load. Michelle was a proud, proud pirate. She was a proud aunt, proud sister, cousin, and daughter too. Most of all, she beamed with pride when she saw what kind of difference she could make. Whatever challenge was in front of her at the moment didn't matter. She was a call him like I see him type of person who wouldn't hesitate to make decisions for the greater good of the students, faculty, administration, whoever. Her job was to make their day easier, and most times she succeeded. Michelle was never really accused of being a yes man, and uh, that's one of her most redeeming traits in my heart, because uh, I, I, I have struggled with that myself. I question everything. Uh, why? Why is it that way? Why can't we do it different? Um, that's probably the best lesson that she taught me uh, and, and the way she lived and the way she handled herself. Um, she wasn't afraid to question the status quo if she felt strongly on the topic. Uh, Mike actually uh, showed me the couple of items in her office that he would fidget with during his lectures uh, while she was trying to coach him in the right direction to get her way. And uh, yeah. <laughs> eventually I'm sure it hit your desk, Mr. Luck. Having said all that, I mean, overwhelming is, seems like a tarnished word. It's, it's just amazing to see this many people sharing this many stories. And, and I hope most or all of you can come join us afterwards for a little get together and uh, we can party it up Suli style, okay? So the beer is on ice, the chicken is ordered. I hope you all can make it out there. And thank you again for coming out here. What a joyous occasion on such a sad day. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, as we finish, we're going to uh, start with the folks that are seated on this side, and we're gonna come by the memorial table. You'll head out to the hallway uh, through that exit sign, take a right, and then you'll be able to uh, get out, back out to the parking lot. 
Uh, once we finish that side, we're going to uh, start over there. And of course, all of our uh, folks sitting in the middle on the floor, we will uh, pay our last respects as we go by. I want to thank everyone for coming today. I know the family has invited everyone over to the VFW in American Legion. I was checking to see if you were on top of it, Rick. Thank you. And uh, we will uh, continue the celebration there. So at this time, uh, I'm going to come over and ask the ladies to start on this end. And we will uh, file by the, uh, the memorial table and pay our last respects. Thank you for coming. And I know Michelle has a big smile on her face. Uh, thanks again. <laughs>